to do songs, so put your hands together. Let's sing it out together. Come on.
together, nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is no other way but Jesus Christ for salvation. Amen. Let's sing it out together. What can wash? Come on. of the blind man that was healed by Jesus. In that chapter, verse 25, this blind man said, one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And I pray that our eyes this morning will be open to God's love, to Jesus, so we can truly see who he is. Amen. We're gonna sing this song, and I'm gonna teach you guys the chorus, and you guys join me on the second time. So this is how the chorus goes. Oh, I can see now. Oh, I can see the love in your eyes. Lay yourself down. And raising up the broken. I can see, oh, I can see now, oh, I can see the love in your eyes, lay yourself down, and raising up the
welcome. I'm Roger, and I'm the discipleship pastor, and I uh, want to welcome everyone on, on Facebook uh, watching us. And so, oh, yeah, yeah, I got to tell you about our trip to the DR. It was amazing on another occasion. So it's baseball season, and no, I don't have any prompts uh, to bring you this morning. I did buy my grandson a hat to a little bat, wooden bat from the Dominican Republic, and uh, I'll have to see what he does with it. Now, <laughs> I'm not too sure why I bought it for him because I'm, I don't think I can teach him much about baseball, although I love baseball. Um, when I was about eight or nine years old, growing up in Perth, Amboy, New Jersey, I, um, I had bought my Mets uniform, and I was a little chubby boy. By age 12, I was 149 pounds, so you can imagine. And uh, I would chew on chicken. Maybe, maybe you guys know this because I've talked about different illustrations of my baseball career in the past, but... Uh, I would chew on chicken and imitate it was like tobacco, you know, and go around acting tough with the kids, you know. But uh, I wasn't too good. You know, in li Little League uh, Baseball, they let everybody's supposed to play, and there's seven innings, and they, everybody has to play, so they would leave me always to the seventh inning. <laughs> it's too bad. But, uh, you, know, um, you know, you always want to imitate folks. You know, you're growing up, and I want to imitate different careers and things like that. I wanted to become a cowboy and a music conductor, just not sure in what order. Um, and uh, in my early years, I wanted to be an Air Force pilot, but had corrected vision back then. You couldn't be a, a pilot. Um, perhaps the best I got in imitating someone, and you guys know this, um, was John Travolta. Yes, yes, yes. I had a three-piece white suit and a black shirt. I did enter some contest. I did win, and I was twice on TV. I just have no proof of it. But uh, I still know some of my disco moves, okay? But, you know, we all grow up, and we always want to imitate. Kids who love to imitate their, dad, their dads and their moms. You know, they grow up uh, wanting to imitate. You know, we grow up in whatever profession we, we are part of, we read upon that, and, you know, we want to learn best practices and all that. We want to imitate and be successful. The Bible talks about imitation, or actually imitating other people. And um, the word, from our English word, mimic, comes from the Greek word that's used for uh, following the example of Christ. That God wants us to imitate. Now, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, the NIV has it, follow my example. That's, that's Paul, a leader in the early church, and he's saying, follow my example. In the ESV, another translation, it says, Be imitators of me, for I am uh, of Christ. Now, more I raise in for me is the same Apostle Paul, this leader who wrote 13 of the books in the New Testament. When in Ephesians 5.1, he says, Be imitators of God. Now, I want you to just think about that for a moment. Let it sink in. Imitators of God. How do you understand that? I mean, God is so different from you and from me. God, you know, God in his perfections, he is omniscient, he's omnipresent, he's holy. I, I'm none of those things. So what does it mean to imitate God? Thankfully, in the same passage in Ephesians 5, Paul is going to tell us what it means to be an imitator of God. And that's what we want to talk about today. Because if you are a Christ follower, if you're following Jesus Christ, God categorically says you have to imitate God. And so to imitate God, to simplify, is saying, you know, follow the example of Jesus. Be like Jesus. Follow the example laid out by Jesus. So this morning, I want you to think about that. Am I imitating God? How can I imitate God? How can I better imitate God in my life? That's the word that God has for us this morning. God wants you and I to concentrate this morning on what it means to imitate God. I don't care if you're a junior high kid or you're, in a, you know, you're a high school student, university, you're married, single. Wherever you are in life, you know, God says, imitate me. And so we're going to be studying the book of Ephesians this morning. <laughs> And Ephesians is a, is a book that was written to the church in Ephesus in the area of what today is uh, Turkey in an Asia, Asia Minor back in biblical times in the southwest corridor of that area. Uh, if you look at the book of Revelation, there were 
seven churches uh, sent to different churches in that area. One of them was the church to Ephesus. And Ephesus was a, quite a city, a lot of idolatry, worship of different idols, a lot of sex, a lot of drunkenness, a lot of division. It was a place, and it's to this church that Paul is going to write the book to which we're going to study this morning. And he wants to encourage Christians like he's encouraging us this morning, and he wants you to know who you are in Christ, your relationship in Christ. Everything that God has done for you, everything that God calls you to be. And characteristic of Paul, look at Romans, look at Colossians, look at all his letters. He would always take the first part of his letter and kind of build doctrine, strong teaching, sound doctrine, theology, the study of God, the study of Scripture, study always the first part of a book. Then he will build on that. He says, since these things are true, this is the kind of folks God wants you to be. So he built on that in chapters 1, 2, and 3, and he tells you everything that God has done for you. And then starting in chapter 4, he's going to say, hey, since this is true, that God has done so much for you, what kind of life should you live? A life worthy, he says, of the call that God has placed upon your life. So let's look in our Bibles. If you brought your Bible this morning, if not, we can just read from, from the screen. But Ephesians 4, 29 through 5, 7. Now, whenever you study a scripture or a passage, you want to study it in its context. And we can't. It's too broad. It goes all the way back to chapter 4, verse 17, to chapter 5, verse 20. But I want to recommend to you, sometime this, this day, tomorrow, this week, spend some time reading through the book of Ephesians. And the broader context of this passage that we're going to look at today Starts in verse 17 and goes all the way to verse 20. But we're just going to read a sample from 29 uh, through 5, 7. And it says, it's kind of long, but follow along. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. With whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. Brawl and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children. And live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, Christians, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are what? Improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, and coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be imitators with them. So in Ephesians 4 and 5. Paul wants to challenge us as beloved children of God to imitate God by loving others as Christ loved us and living a life of holiness. So what about God can be imitated? How well am I imitating those things about God that can be imitated? And how can I better imitate God? So, Lord, I'm excited about you this morning. I'm excited about your word. And I'm excited... Because there's a message for me and for each one here. And we give you all the praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So let's look first of all at Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. He says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love 
just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is that that verb is in the imperative. We are to be imitators of God, and that's strong. This is what we are to strive for and concentrate on. It's the same type of verbal form that we find in verse 15 and 18. In 515, he says, be very careful. It's an order. It's a command. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but wise. Don't be foolish in the way you make decisions in life. Be careful how you live. You're honoring God. Your life belongs to God. If you're a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, your life belongs to God. Be careful how you live. In verse 18, he says, these are two imperatives. He says, do not get drunk on wine. doesn't say you can't drink alcohol. Some of us prefer to abstain. He says, do not drink or do not get drunk on wine or any other kind of alcohol, which leads to debauchery, which is a Greek word, which, which means lack of control. Instead, another imperative in the present tense, be being filled with the Spirit. These are imperatives. Be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Be under the control of the Holy Spirit. It's the same Greek term or verb that's used in Matthew 28, 19, when he says, therefore, go and make disciples. It's an order. It's a command. It's an imperative. It's the same kind of force here when he says, be imitators of God. It's not an option. He says, Christian, my dearly loved child, imitate me. Mimic me. Follow my example. So the question is, how can we imitate or mimic God? Or Ephesians 4.32, right in the immediate context, it tells us something specific. Listen, this is profound because it goes against our nature. (laughs) He says, be kind. Be kind. Not to those who are kind with you. That's the easiest thing. If you love those who love you, An extra mile with those that walk the extra mile with you. That's awesome. Be kind to those who irk you. (laughs) Rub you the wrong way. Be kind and compassionate. Feel for people. Have sympathy for people. Be moved by the struggles that other people are going through. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. To forgive in the Greek means to not to hold guilty, to, to let go, to free somebody of their guilt against you. Forgive others as God in Christ has forgiven you. Listen, if you're here and you're a child of God, you have experienced the amazing gift, free gift of God's complete forgiveness of all your sins. And it is when you begin to think about who God, is it hard? Is it easy? It's very difficult when somebody has hurt you when somebody has offended you, when somebody has hurt somebody in your family, it is very difficult to extend forgiveness. But when you begin to think about who God is, who is much greater, and yet he is able to love you because that's who God is. He is love. Then he says, think about how God has been forgiven of you. Extend forgiveness to other people. And then verse 2, when he says, be imitators of God and walk in the way of love. That and there can be translated, that is, walk in the way of love. In other words, be imitators of God. In other words, that is, by following the example of Jesus, who loved us and gave himself up for us. It says, as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Why was this a fragrant a sacrifice to God? Wow. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he made possible the forgiveness of every man, woman, and child. And in that, God was pleased. God was not pleased in the fact that his son died for your sins and my sins. But God was pleased in that that perfect sacrifice of Christ once and for all was sufficient to pay for all your sins. And now you are justified. You are right with God. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? So I think that when we study this passage, we could go further back in the context of chapter 4 and see the contrast that, that Paul is making with the Gentiles. 
When the Bible talks about Gentiles, it's a, a Greek word that means nations. That's you and me. So we have the Jewish and we have the Gentiles. We're Gentiles, unless there's a Jewish person here, descendant of Abraham, physically. But Gentiles. And Paul is making a contrast all the way back in chapter 4. He's saying, Gentiles who have no connection with God, they're not in a relation with God. They live a certain kind of lifestyle. You guys are believers. You're part of a new community. This is the way I want you to live. Not like the Gentiles are living. I want you to live differently because of everything that God has done for you. Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. And so listen to Ephesians 4, 17 through 19 using the New Living Translation. There's a lot of different modern translations. I'm using the New Living Translation here. It captures it well. With the Lord's authority, I say this. Live no longer. Do you see that thread that he's, he's building on? Live no longer. He's exhorting them right from the beginning because the possibility is that someone who is in Christ can at times go back and live like a Gentile, like someone that does not. He's saying, don't live that way. They're, they're living in this city called Ephesus that has all these characteristics that are ungodly. They're in that mist of that city, idolatry, sex, drunkenness. And he's saying, don't live any longer like that. Live like who you are in Christ. You are a new creation. Live a new life. So he says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure, eagerly practicing every kind of impurity. In other words, they live life's opposite of God's holy nature and character. And so Paul goes on to exhort believers to put off the old self and put in the new self, which he says in Ephesians 4, 24, created to be what? Like God. Let's say that again. Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The, the new self is what theologians call the new humanity. In Christ, we are made new creations with the characteristics of that perfect man, Jesus. And we are to emulate Jesus. That's why, what is the goal of the Christian life? Very basic. Romans 8, 29. You are predestined by God to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Everything that's going on in your life today, and that's not the kind of sermon I want to preach, but we could easily go that way, right? Everything that's going on in your life today is being used, God, to conform you. Everything that has happened or God has allowed in the last three months or six months or year in your life somehow is trying to spur you to look to him so that you can be molded into the image of Christ. And my friends, when you and I imitate God and his love and his holiness, we are displaying a new kind of humanity, a redeemed, forgiven, and completely new kind of man, woman, and child that images Christ to the world. And isn't this what the cities and the communities need? Images of God. Images of Christ. So in the broader context of 417 through 21, he gives us a few ways we can imitate God. I've alluded to them, but let's look at this. How can we imitate God? Number one, write it down in your notes. We can imitate God's forgiveness. Again, be kind and compassionate, forgiving each other as in Christ God forgave you. When we realize how much bigger and holier God is than each one of us and his willingness to forgive us our sins, we can begin to take baby steps to forgive with God's help those who possibly have caused you pain and suffering. And 1 John 3, 16 and 18 says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for who? For us. And my friends, that's the principle that we as Christians are to live. We are to be laying our lives down for others. It doesn't necessarily mean that you give your life physically in sacrifice, but it does mean to serve, 
And then John gives us an illustration. He says, as we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister, if Venture Church has material possessions and we see a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? If you have the means to help someone and God prompts your heart, God says if you love that individual or you're loving that person who's going through that situation, you are prompted to sacrifice, to lay your life down for that individual and help. A family cannot always help. A church is not always in a position to help. But when we are, the Bible says that we have to live under the principle of Jesus who laid his life down for us. 1 John 3.16 talks about that. It's the life that Jesus came, gave for us. So here's a question. Is there someone in your life you need to forgive? Is there someone in your life you need to love in a practical way? We can imitate God in his love when we forgive others, when we're kind and compassionate, but also we can imitate God in his holiness in his holiness. God is not only love. People love to say that. Oh, smile. God loves you. I've never seen a little sticker or a little smiley face that says, smile. God is holy. But God is holy. Isaiah 6 talks about God being holy, holy, holy. In the book by Jerry Bridges, it's a classic called The Pursuit of Holiness. And I recommend that you you buy this book and you read it. Jot it down. The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. Every Christian should read this. Every family should read this. He says this about God's holiness. As used in Scripture, holiness describes both the majesty of God and the purity and moral perfection of his nature. Just as he cannot but know what is right, So God cannot but do what is right. God's holiness is perfect freedom from all evil. So since God is holy, he wants us to mimic his holiness. And so Paul is going to warn us and encourage us. Listen to what he says in Ephesians 5, 3, 4. Serious stuff, profound words. I asked the Lord, Lord, what do you want us to preach this week? And this is what God gave us. And the beautiful thing about just going through Scripture, and Tim will do that, and John will do it, and all of us will do that, is that when you get to certain passages, you just can't skip over them. you got to preach them just like they are. So this is deep. It's it's tough, but we got to get through it. So he says, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed. Sexual immorality is pornea. It's a general word in Greek. Uh, We think about pornea from where we get pornography. That's just one aspect. But the way the word was used, it was very inclusive of different types of impropriety, sexual deviance, things that do not glorify God. He says, "Don't, don't even give a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed Because these are improper for God's holy people, or like it really says in the original, for holy people. For holy people. You might not realize this, but God not only calls you beloved, he says that you are his beloved. He calls you a child of God. He says that you are the apple of his eye, but he also calls you a saint. If you come out of Roman Catholicism, you understand this concept, but... It's about people who have been separated for God. God says that you are a saint. He calls us holy ones. And that basically means that you have been separated from sin and unto God. To be holy, listen, to be holy means to be separated from sin and unto God. That's why we cannot look at sin or temptation um, lightly. We have to look at a life of holiness as something to which we are called, not by our own work or strength, but by his grace, we can live a life that honors God. So I want to be a holy father. I want to be a holy husband. I want to be a holy 
a coworker. I want to be a holy friend. I want my life, my thoughts, my affections, my everything about me to be separate. Am I always holy? Am I always God glorifying? No. No one can tell you they are 100% always God glorifying. But God is good and God is working in our lives. So, just an exhortation. Men, men, protect your eyes. Men, I saw some couples hugging here while we were worshiping. Awesome. You're allowed to do that here. That's okay. We encourage it. Not too much hugging, but you know you can. (laughs) Men, stay close to your wives. Young men, flee temptations. Women, watch what you read, what you watch, and how you dress. Christian teenagers, both male and females, honor the Lord with your bodies and save yourself as a precious gift for your spouse the night of your honeymoon. Old-fashioned, yes, but it works, and it is God-honoring. We are holy, set apart for the Lord, and we are to imitate God in His holiness. Paul goes on to uh, exhort believers with penetrating truths. He says in Ephesians 5, 5 through 7, For of this you can be sure. You can be sure of this. No immoral, impure, greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Now, that phrase has, any, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. You've got to deal with that phrase. Sometimes when you're studying the Bible, you read it, you go to a certain part, and you say, ooh, I don't know what to do with it. I just jump over and go. And that's okay. But come back to it because we're, we're Christians. We're people of the book. We should be students of the Bible. So when it says here that, that this kind of person will not inherit the kingdom of Christ. What is Paul saying? There's different ways of looking at this. Some people teach that what that's saying is that if you think you are a believer, if you think that you are a follower of Christ, that you're truly a Christian, but you have some of these characteristics, and he mentions 10 vices in that list, then guess what? You will not inherit the kingdom of, oh, of heaven because those people that will not be in the, in the kingdom of heaven, will not enter heaven, you know, are those people that have that type of behavior and lifestyle. Well, nowhere in this passage is Paul putting in doubt whether somebody's a Christian or not, at least to the ones that he's writing to. He's making a contrast. He's saying, this is the way the Gentiles live. These are their characteristics. Don't be like them. (laughs) That's not who you are. You're part of this new community. Don't be characterized by those people that will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And, and, and don't be deceived. What does he say? Do not be deceived because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. He's telling the Christians, listen, this is the characteristic of the lifestyle of those people that don't know God. And they're not inheriting the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. If you work that way or act that way, you will come under God's discipline. Don't be partners with them. And I have many verses I can show you to tell you that even though God's wrath in the sense that there's no penalty for you when you come to Jesus, there's no condemnation for you when you come to Jesus, there's no eternal condemnation for you. God's judgment, God's discipline comes upon you if you're a child of God. Listen, if you have a child, if you have a daughter, if you have a son, and they're going wayward in their lifestyle. Isn't it correct? Isn't it proper for you as a father, as a mother, to discipline your children? Isn't it to be loving to discipline your children? Don't we, don't we warn them? And that's what God is doing to the Ephesians. He's saying, I know where you live. <laughs> I know the characteristics of the city where you live. Don't be like them. You're not them. Don't. Live any longer. Remember what he said in verse 17, chapter 4? Don't live any longer. He's making a contrast. He's saying, Christians, that's not who you are. And God cannot be mocked. If you're truly saved, if the Holy Spirit lives in you, and you're a child of God, live a life of love and live a life of holiness. 
And if we're not, it says God's wrath, or in other words, God's judgment of sin will come upon you. Hard. But that's what God's saying here. Whatever interpretation one gives to this phrase, Paul wants us to be clear that how you live your life does matter to him. If you are a Christian, a born-again follower of Christ, you are to live a life that's separated to God in your thoughts, in your attitude, and in your actions. And if not, God's wrath can fall upon you. God says in Hebrews chapter 12 that the child that he loves, he what? He disciplines. He disciplines. Why? Because God's goal for you and for me is to become what? Conformed to the image of Christ. So in conclusion, I have a few questions for you to consider. Think of home, dads and moms. Are you a godly example to your husband or to your wife? Are you a godly example to your children? Granddads, grandmas, are you helping to raise your grandchildren in the fear of the Lord? How will your attitude towards your job or the hours you spend working look differently because you are imitating God's forgiveness toward those who bug you or irk you? Is the fact that God is holy making a difference in how you work? How will God's call for you to be holy impact your thought life? And how do you relate to the opposite sex? Are you drawing boundaries? Are you turning away when temptation comes, when you feel attracted to somebody of the opposite sex who's not your spouse? Are there TV shows or things on your iPhone you just need to stop watching? God says, imitate me in my love and imitate me in my holiness. Have you experienced God's complete forgiveness for your sins? I pray and I hope that everyone here is enjoying complete forgiveness with God. My prayer would be that each one of us here has come to a point where you said, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins. I receive you as my Savior. I commit my life to you to follow you. I pray that everyone here is in right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And if you have... If you are a child of God, God now says that you are to extend forgiveness to others. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. And again, just banking on that a little bit. I know when somebody has hurt us deeply, how difficult it is to apply that verse. I understand that struggle. Perhaps someone close to you has offended you. Perhaps a Christian brother or family member how are you going to respond? Perhaps you need to forgive your spouse for something terrible they've done. Listen, as a pastor of 35 years, and Tim can say the same thing, and Fernando and all of us here who are pastors, we've dealt with a lot of couples. Sometimes marriages can be rescued, salvaged. But if there's a little hope, a little light, a little ray of hope that there can be reconciliation, the power of God can reconcile and save a marriage and we can extend forgiveness no matter what the sin has been. No matter. I want to be like Paul. And I want to be like Jesus. Yet, my friends, as a pastor, if I'm honest with you, I'm not always like Paul or like Jesus. Sometimes the ugliness of my soul is hidden deep inside where no one can take notice and where no one can read my heart. But God is faithful. How can I imitate God? Quickly, reflect more on God. Read some good literature on who God is. Begin to concentrate more upward. Get your eyes off the, of, the, of the mundane and begin to just discipline yourself to look upward. Read some good literature. Think about God. Study the Trinity. See the majesty of God. Reflect more on God. Confess and repent more. We need to acknowledge our sins. And guys and gals, we need to turn away. That's what repent means. Turn away. If you need help, there's a lot of pastors and good leaders here that will pray with you. Repent. Acknowledge your sin. Turn away from it. Don't open a window to Satan. 
Don't open a window to demonic attacks on your life or your spouse or your children. Close those windows. Don't give Satan an inch. Pray more. Ask Jesus to teach you to pray. And then live in the power of the Spirit and in obedience to his promptings. Promptings. The Lord is speaking. The Lord is moving. Be sensitive. How is God speaking to me? How is God speaking to my marriage, to my family? So we end with this and we pray. Beloved, in what area of your life do you need God's help to imitate him? Maybe during our time this morning, God spoke to you. This is an area where God said, hey, you're really good here. But in this area, you're not imitating me. You're not mimicking me. And maybe God this morning is telling you right now, I want you to mimic me here. This is an area you need my help. I'm just asking you to pray and say, Lord, help me imitate you in this area. Father, we love you and we praise you. Holy Spirit, do the work that only you can do. We will praise you. We will love you. Give you all recognition because what we do is in your name and in your power. Bless Venture Church as we continue to go out into the community and bless others, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.